Today, Alex and I go over self-limiting beliefs. We talk about some of the ones that we've conquered from our past, as well as some that you might have when it comes to starting coaching or your health and fitness journey. We would love if you could share this with a friend. And if you're looking for some glute growth, don't forget our 12-week glute program is now available. I will have it in the show notes in the description box below, but we'll catch you on the inside. How peaceful was this past Sunday for you with the Packers not playing on Sunday and already having a win under our belt? It was good. I, I thought that this weekend was one that I finally felt like myself after a couple weeks of, yeah, ob- for obvious reasons, being in a, a different headspace. And so Saturday and Sunday were great days for me. And uh, so I had an awesome day. How was, how was your Sunday? It was awesome being able to just not worry about my team losing or anything. And over the weekend, also, we did a done of cleaning, and I was able to do a closet clean out, which has been on my to-do list for a very long time. And I tried on every piece of clothing that I own to make sure that if it fit or not, and if it was my style anymore or not, and I will have a lot to go through to send out some stuff to people um, and some bags to go to Goodwill for sure. I did six loads of laundry over the weekend, a a record amount in one singular day to do and dry and then fold and put away. It was uh, the most liberating thing ever (laughs) where I felt like I lost 50 pounds. It's like the things that create the most brain fog for me, especially with us working from home, is general chores around the house not being done. And because of the circumstances, those things just got kind of put on the back burner. Um, or I, you know, we were pushing to do just the general task. And so to do all those things this past weekend of just cleaning our bedroom, cleaning the bathroom, um, doing all the laundry, cleaning up on uh, like the kitchen and everything was amazing. I feel yeah. so much better going into this week. <laughs> it was so great. And on Honestly, it was nice because we could just have football on the TVs for college football, and then you were able to fold and watch some football and just be able to lock in the zone but still do stuff, which I find is always the best way to do it. Hold a little carrot out in front of yourself where you can watch and enjoy something while you're doing it. Absolutely. Well, I know for the Packer season, you had some limiting beliefs about how well they were going to do. I've always believed. Uh I've been a big believer. A lot of people can vouch for me there. But I thought that we could talk about some self-limiting beliefs today and be able to talk about how it applies to coaching and how that also might be holding you back from the life you want to live or the goals you want to achieve. So what is something that is a past self-limiting belief for you or something you're currently working on? I am very stubborn. Did you know that? Oh, I've never known that about you. So I'm very stubborn. And uh, one of my limiting beliefs is that I can always do stuff myself. I don't need anybody's help. I'm going to do it myself. And I would rather get all the bumps and bruises on my own than trying to get a, a resource to help guide me in different scenarios. And so I have notoriously in the past been very hard headed to get any help and, and saying that I can figure it out on my own, which there are pros to that mentality of uh, being resourceful to figure things out on your own. But there are also some extreme cons of slowing down the process tremendously with just not allowing for yourself to ask for help. Um, and, and it probably is multifactorial in the sense that I didn't want to ask for help for the thought of maybe being perceived as not as smart or being perceived as like lesser than, if you will, uh, which as I've gotten into the space significantly more, no one thinks that. And, and we'll probably talk about that more, but that's probably the biggest one. What is one that you've experienced? I would say just a lot of self-doubt in general, and especially in regards to my body, of thinking that I could never look a certain way. I know that you and I have had a lot of conversations about kind of what it has been growing up for both of us in our bodies and the the thoughts and feelings we had through middle school and high school and how that shaped us into the lifestyle that we live now. But I always felt that 
I just couldn't look a certain way. It wasn't in my genes. It wasn't in my genetics. There was just no possible way for me to look the way that I wanted and to live a life that I really wanted to get there. Because I thought, oh, maybe I can look that way, but it's going to be eating foods I don't like. It's going to be miserable. I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm not going to be able to sustain it. So it's just not in the cards for me. And that's probably one of the largest ones that's been a catapult for everything else, where, of course, my looks are just one side of me, but that belief in yourself and being able to recognize and acknowledge when it is just your own cast of a belief onto yourself instead of the actual truth of what the reality is and what you're capable of. Because you, everyone's heard it, whether you think you can or you can't, you're correct. And I think that that really falls into place here is whether you think that you can never achieve a certain body type, if you keep thinking that, you probably never will achieve a certain body type because you have told yourself that that is the case and that's what's going to happen. And one really cool thing I've heard about self-sabotage, it was actually very, I felt very targeted by it, was that we self-sabotage because it gives the illusion of control. And because you think, oh, I know how this is going to happen, then you feel more in control. But really, you're just pushing yourself further and further away way from the thing that you actually want, but with that illusion of the control. Right. Another limiting belief that I held on to for a long time was financial, just because of how I grew up. Uh, and I have a funny story from my dad actually today on the phone. Um, I grew up in what I would consider lower middle class. I was very fortunate that my parents did absolutely everything to get me what I needed. Um, I was not aware that we did not have the funds for many of the things that I did that my parents just found a way to, to figure out. Um, and I carried that financial mentality of, of scarcity for a, a very long time, probably until the last, I would say, four-ish years. And there's there's instances where maybe things aren't going as well as they, they should be or what I plan to be at this current time. And those thoughts or mentalities start to creep back in. Um, but I've, I've done significantly better with it now than I have in the past. And the, the funny story was, was, is that um, when I was little, I my my dad kept a secret from me, which this sounds ridiculous to say, but he kept a secret from me that he smoked cigarettes. I, I really didn't know until I was uh, probably in fourth or fifth grade. And when I found out for whatever reason, I was like heartbroken that he smoked cigarettes. And I remember crying tears down my face over a bowl of SpaghettiOs for whatever reason that's still in my mind. And that made him quit smoking cigarettes because it tore him up to see how sad I was. And he said, he, I learned this today, actually, that another driving force there was that he would be paid from his insurance $500 if he went six months with not smoking cigarettes. And I needed a new baseball bat because I was changing the field that I was playing on. I needed a bigger baseball bat. And at the time they didn't have the, the finances to make that happen. And so between him being heartbroken of, of me, but then also the component of me needing a new bat and that $500 from the insurance company, he was able to get the $500 and, and just quit cold turkey. And so that was a funny story for me to hear today. <laughs> and Alex just getting exactly what he wants. Of course. <laughs> Do you believe that when it comes to self-sabotage that it's actually a mismatch between your values and your behavior? Or in other words, a mismatch between your effort and your expectation or goal that you're trying to achieve? I think so. I think it could be uh, attributed to that. I think another aspect that could be in play would be not – you only know how much you know. And – I think that oftentimes the fear of the possibility of how expensive something could be or how challenging something could be is another very strong limiting belief of I'm comfortable in this situation, even if it sucks or what have you, there's a level of comfort because you know what's, what's going to happen or what is happening as you just talked about. And so certainly there's a misalignment with expectations relative to reality, but there's also this lingering fear of... I don't even know what is to come, so I don't even want to open the the box, if you will. Change can be scary, and it can be something that 
I personally fear. And I know for myself, once I've seen that it's possible, then I'm so much more open to doing it. And it doesn't always have to be me to see that it's possible, uh, like through me experiencing it, but even someone in a similar situation to me of seeing that they can do it, it makes me believe, okay, I can take this step and I can do this thing. But sometimes it can still be paralyzing of you have this fear and you're like, but what if I can't make that change? What if I can't see that success that I'm wanting? And then it starts to be that you just don't think that you're good enough and you don't think that you can make it happen or you can never look that way, whatever it may be. And then you begin to adhere to that belief system. And then that just leaves you at the same place, very stagnant with whatever your goals are. Because of course, again, another very common saying of growth is outside of your comfort zone. But truthfully, if you are going to progress in any way, you will need to do something that's uncomfortable. And normally on the other side of that uncomfortable thing is what we really want out of life. And I think that also circles back around to uh, being able to have delayed gratification within what we're doing of we live in a society where we want it now. And that's another way I feel like we self-sabotage or we limit ourselves is we take a little step in the direction that we want to and the result doesn't yield this ginormous result. And so then we are, again, we predicted that result. We knew that was going to happen. We knew we weren't going to see success. And then we take a step back and it's like, oh, that didn't work for me. And it's like, you didn't actually do it. So you don't know if it worked for you. And I think that's extremely common. Do you have an example of maybe someone that you saw do something that unlocked possibilities for you of I'm capable of doing more for myself? I think that for, especially for my body, it came from seeing another girl at my college that was looking the way that I wanted to. And so it was something where I saw her going to the gym and her doing things, and I wanted to have that change for myself. And so I really looked at what's the best that can happen and what's the worst that can happen. Because the worst that could happen is that I don't like it and I just go back to living the way that I am all right, I'm already living this way. It, it's not bad enough for me to change, it seems. So if that's worst case scenario that I end up in the same spot that I started, it's really not that bad of a situation. But best case scenario is that I find something that I really like and that shows me results and I'm able to make it into a lifestyle so I can feel happier on a day-to-day in my body. I'm not fighting my body and limitations that I've put on myself. I'm not fighting myself anymore. And I have so much possibility and capability to do whatever else I want. And so when I looked at it that way, it was like, all right, I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to go all in on this and I'm going to see where it takes me. And I think that you've had this happen within clients before of clients getting started and they might you tell them to do something and it's like, oh, well, I've, I've always done it this way or this is the way that I want to do it. Uh, and you have to combat that and be able to talk to them about this is why we're doing it this way and why I need you to trust what I'm saying so that we can see the results that you want to see. Right. Uh, yeah. I think that having the example and understanding that the person or or thing that you're wanting to have is not special. They're not any different than you. Maybe their opportunities, maybe their their luck or their their breaks have happened at different times. But the reality is, is that they've just put more time or effort into that thing that you're wanting to accomplish. And uh, understanding that those examples just allow for you to have a, a somewhat of a blueprint to accomplish what you want to have and you're not lesser than that individual. You just need to to keep chasing after whatever the goal is. When you talked about your be- self-limiting belief of not wanting to ask for help because you thought it would come across that you didn't know what you were doing or you weren't capable, were you talking about that in application to getting help for getting a coach for yourself? I, yeah, I would say that it was a, a, a coach for myself, but even furthermore, resources for education for coaching, uh, because especially in, in the space of fitness coaching, 
you say five years ago. At that time, I'm three to four years in. Some people are starting to hear my name a little bit more than what they would have previously. And I wanted it to be something where they heard my name and I knew exactly what was going on. I knew exactly everything that I needed to do to continue to make my ways up the ranks, if you will. Um, when in reality, as you're going through coaching, it's just a matter of continuing to network and learn more from each of us because we all have different experiences and, and um, different knowledge and, and different strengths to be able to to share. And individuals who are great at coaching are very passionate about coaching. There's, I have not met someone who is very good at coaching and is like not happy about <laughs> do, being you know in the space. And so to be able to educate about something you're passionate about is such a fun experience. And so actually asking the questions strengthened my relationships with a lot of other individuals and also opened me up to a situation where I was holding myself back so much. I could have been much further ahead by just asking questions and reaching out and um, getting the help where I needed it to. And uh, so I, I find tremendous value in just guidance as well as as coaching as a whole. Do you feel like you had the mentality of, I can do this myself? Of course. I mean, that's, I think that that goes in tandem with the financial limitations that I was placing on myself until I finally, because the first coach that I got, I did not have the, the resources to be able to pay that person when I first started. Um, but I found ways to go about doing that so that I could have the coach. Um, and it also showed me where I was wasting money as well as how much more resourceful I can get with the opportunities that I had around me. I picked like, uh, at that time I, I got another job. I was doing all these different things, uh, and it allowed for me to, to pay for the coaching as a whole. I love that you brought that up of you found a way to make it happen. Cause I think that cost when it comes to coaching is a hundred percent, something that holds people back. And a lot of times I think that comes down to value because of exactly what you just said. If it, is of value to you, then you normally find a way to make it happen. And you've done that and proven that multiple times throughout your life, where when it came to proposing to me, you didn't really have the funds to buy me a <laughs> ring and everything. I didn't have the funds for any of that. <laughs> yes. And you said, I, I, I'm doing it anyway, and I'm finding a way to make this happen. And you yeah. did find a way. It's not that you spent irresponsibly and then you just had to like bury yourself. It was this is important to me, this is a priority, and you are really discerning the difference between what's something I would like to have in my life and what's something that I absolutely need to have in my life. Yeah. And you have done it time and time again, again, with different scenarios. And even for myself, when I first hired my first coach, I was in college, I did not have a job at the time, I was very broke, and my parents were not going to be paying towards that because they were helping me with other things. Like rightfully so, I don't have any feelings towards that. Um, but I was in a place where I decided I'm doing this. And I found a way to make it happen of being able to get a job. I ended up retiring from my city job to get some retirement money to be able to put towards the the coaching because it meant that much to me. And I saw the value and not just the value of, okay, this this situation right now, if I'm going to have someone to coach me or for accountability, but even more so of what this is doing of betting on myself and what this is allowing me to have in the long run for my quality of life in the long run, instead of, again, just looking short term or for that instant gratification, I was able to look at what is this going to bring to me and this is worth it for a lifelong lifestyle change that's going to make me happy. Right. And, and I think that I am such a proponent of feet to the fire, gamble on yourself, and trust that you're going to figure it out. Um, I, I have seen it time and time again in my life. I've seen it time and time again in other individuals' life where uh, you're willing to, to go down with the ship type mentality. You're going to figure out a way to plug the holes in the ship and get that thing floating again um, when you just don't have another option and, and you don't allow for yourself to um, be in a headspace that there's another way that you could do it. Like This is the thing that you want. This is the way that you're wanting to go about it and, and 
go after it, go a hundred percent for it. And don't force yourself to be in a, a timeline that's not necessary. I think that many individuals put themselves in a timeline that they don't really know what the timeline can even be. Uh, for example, I can speak for myself here that when we started physique development, I thought we would grow significantly faster. I thought it would all come together significantly faster. And I had put this, I'd put timelines on it of, we're gonna have this goal and get here by this point, and then this point, and then this point. And I had created those goals without talking to anyone who had created a business of that structure that had grown a coaching business to what it can be and what I wanted it to be. And like those timelines are not, it's great for me to set goals, but at the end of the day, I had no reference point for, is that even accomplishable? What is the percentage of chance of those things actually happening? Um, and having a, a coach at that time, if I could have afforded to do so in the realm of, of learning to build a coaching brand, um, would have been a tremendous help, you know, in that scenario. But I, I think that putting these, uh, not backed timelines on yourself is unfair to you. And so by having the the resources or having the guidance in these ventures that you're wanting to delve into are tremendously important. And I can, again, speak for myself in this year, I have invested very heavily in these different forms of physical activity between yoga and through running. Um, and I very easily could have just started running and been like, I'm going to run one mile today and I'm going to keep just increasing my mileage every single week. And I can use YouTube resources and these different factors to try and piece it all together. But instead I got a running coach in person and went every other week to meet with her and still do. Um, and I've, I have expedited the results that I was accomplishing by doing so. And I can assure you that if I didn't work with her, I would probably not be running now because I'd be injured. injured. <laughs> I'd, I'd have done something to myself. I would have pushed far too hard. I would have gotten in a race that I shouldn't have gotten into too early. Um, all the things, because I know myself, I know that I'm, like I said, I'm all in when I want to do things and um, that can be a detriment. And so having that guidance to kind of pull back the reins when needed is important. I, as you can tell with me saying injured at the same time, I 100% agree. And it's so great to see your growth in being able to ask for help and mentorship. And you even made a comment of if I could have even afforded business mentorship at that time, which someone could look at a, that's a self-limiting sure. belief because you probably could have if it was a, would have been a priority for right. you. But you also had the self-limiting belief of I don't want to ask for help. And so with that, you were able to push it off and say like, oh, it's financial, I can't make it happen, which a lot of people would understand. But really when we get to the root of it, it's I didn't wanna ask for help. Right. And so I think that's really powerful of now you know yourself and you know what it takes to make sure that you see success. But at that time, you were putting so many limitations on yourself that you didn't know how to get out of it. Yeah, I was still in the phase of getting made fun of and mm -hmm. people telling me that it wasn't going to happen. Like my parents uh, didn't inherently even believe that I could do it at that time either. <laughs> uh, my dad had more belief than my mom did. I would say that the only person, and I don't say this in a negative way because I understand why my parents weren't overly keen on it, of, they wanted me to get a normal job and live the normal life, if you will. Um, the only person was Grandpa Phil. Uh, he had 100% belief that it was going to work from the moment I told him about it. And he was a huge reason why I, I even pushed forward with it because as we got started, it was something that he was sick when we first got started and we had kind of a, a final conversation before he passed and he talked abundantly about how much I needed to better believe in myself. And that was, and I've talked about this a, a number of times, but this has been, that was a, a turning point in my life that I will never forget forever. Um, because I, my life changed after that day and after he passed away, because it was only like two days in between there. My life changed drastically because of that conversation and someone who I held in such high regard, I would call my, my best friend, my childhood best friend, someone who believed in me more than I could have ever believed in myself, telling me that I've got to stop getting in my own way. And um, I've thankfully, and, and uh, with a lot of gratitude, been able to be that person for other individuals as well. And when you have someone who tr tremendously cares about you and really points out and gives you honest feedback, it is invaluable. 
Uh, yes, you've definitely been that for me, which has been stellar. <laughs> uh, but I actually came across a, a study that was done, and I want to read through it because this validated so much of my own personal experience, and it was just cool to see the percentages because I love the math of it all. Uh, but there is a real beauty in that financial accountability and just the personal accountability of having a coach. Uh, so the American Society of Training and Development, ASTD, did a study on accountability for people trying to reach a goal. So here's what they found. The probability of you completing a goal if. So if you have an idea of wanting to lose weight, your probability of completing the goal is 10%. If you consciously decide or declare that you will do it, your probability of you completing it is 25%. Goes up. When you decide when you will do it, 40%. You plan how you will do it, 50%. You commit to someone that you will do it, 65%. You commit financially that you will do it and have specific accountability appointments with the person or coach you committed to, 95%. 95% probability that you will complete a goal if you commit financially that you will do it and have specific accountability appointments with the person or coach you committed to. And if you haven't heard me talk about my first coaching experience, I was so willing to put the money behind it because I knew without that accountability, I knew I needed the personal accountability. But if I didn't put my money where my mouth was, I was going to bail on myself. I knew myself enough at that point that I knew I was going to bail on myself. And I wish I had this study to just be like so obvious to me of if you want to have a 95% probability of success versus a 10% success, then just do this one thing. And it just made so much sense to me at the time. And I've heard of other studies of how much it means for you to put money on the line of when it comes to smoking. They did a study to uh, make people stop smoking. And it was that they either got money put into their bank account at the end of the time frame if they did it, or they got money taken away from their bank account if they didn't do it. And it was such more of a motivator for people to have their own money at risk. Because if it's just money that wasn't yours to begin with, it doesn't feel like that big of a deal. But putting it on the line in that sense allows you to see that success. And so I really wanted to share that study because uh, those percentages were so cool. So I'll also have those in the show notes in case you're a visual person like me, because seeing that visually was awesome as well. If you're just listening to this and thinking, man, I needed to have some better questions when I vetted my coach. We actually put together some questions we thought would be helpful when guiding you to picking the best coach for you. Questions that will be helpful to ask yourself and to ask the coach to really get what you want out of this. So it'll go ahead and be linked down below in the show notes and or the description box. Now, Alex did put up a IG question box asking about why people might not commit to coaching specifically and what type of objections they might have. So I wanted to go through some of those because I really appreciated all the responses that we got, and I thought that they just would speak to a lot of other people as well. So one of those was that pe someone was struggling to trust in what the coach prescribes, especially if it's decreasing training or in and increasing food. So what would you say to someone who is not wanting to commit to a coaching experience because they're struggling to, to, to trust that coach? I believe that they did not do enough vetting prior to hiring the coach or the coach did not provide enough education as to why they're making the change. Because if you understand the why behind the changes and you believe in and understand the why, it's much easier to execute the protocols. But if you're just being given, hey, I know you've been doing this and you enjoy these things, but I'm actually going to do almost the polar opposite. We're going to train less and I'm going to increase your food. And here's the protocols. I'll talk to you again next week. Do not email me. Do not ask me any questions because I'm far too busy and I'm not invested in your goals. That happens. <laughs> and that's when it, it, it you hear it in that way you're, and you immediately think there's no way that you would follow this. this. This seems ridiculous, but it happens a lot. And so 
by making those changes or you're you know making those changes for a client, you have to go through and educate us to why that's the case. And when we're talking about coaching, it's something that needs to be structured in a way that is not just kind of carrying you along, but is taking you through the process and propelling you forward for the future so that you can use these practices for your life. Because when we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about training, these things are going to be aspects to your overall health from now until the the day, if you're fortunate enough, the day that you pass on. And if you can take these tools and and spend the time and, and spend the money now to have the resources or knowledge for the long haul, now obviously you're going to have to expand in different times of changes in life and so on and so forth. But if you can get the, the core foundation work and have a really good um, habits and routines generated from this, the the value is is it's invaluable at that point. And so the education is tremendously important. Now you talked about vetting the coach, which I think is a really important point to make. What are some things that you would suggest for someone to vet a coach? Because we've all been sucked into an ad before and it's just like, okay, I, I bought from this Instagram ad. It got me and I bought it. And sometimes we're highly disappointed where it's like, this isn't what they told me it was going to be on the ad. So how do you vet out a coach or a coaching company properly to even know if they know what they're talking about? I think that there are multiple ways that you can go about this, depending on the media channels that you're following them. So you could have Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and podcast, for example. All those are going to give you different types of information that they would be providing. And so I would look through all of their content. You have so many free resources from a lot of coaches now to be able to get an understanding of how they go about their business, how they go about taking care of the clients, what their client results look like. A lot of them have like the highlights on their Instagram of these are client testimonials or whatever the case may be. And so combing through that and then like you have an opportunity to send DMs, shoot DMs, ask questions. A lot of the coaches, and I know that for myself, I get back to almost everyone that sends questions and um, is wanting to learn more. Like I, I really enjoy getting to have conversation in my DMs on a very regular basis. Um, and I, I am, I don't, maybe people think I get this massive quantity that I don't see them, but um, I certainly see every DM for the most part that comes through. And um, by asking those questions, it just gives you an opportunity to, to connect. And I find those to be super valuable because some of my best clients are people who followed me for a handful of months, six months, uh, a year, and they ask questions in my DMs. And we created a, a, a relationship just through conversation there. And then once they got uh, to the point that they wanted to inquire and work together, it was such a seamless transition for them because I already knew kind of a base of what they knew and what they were going through and all these different things that we were able to hit the ground running even faster when they got into the coaching as a whole. And so with that vetting, like take your time, talk to, if, if you have multiple coaches that you're interested in, in working with, get on the phone with them or, or their sales staff or what have you. I know that for us, we have, we have Lauren who is, is incredible. A, a saint of a human being. Yes. Like I, I cannot speak highly enough of Lauren. And uh, I got a testimonial from a client uh, this morning, actually. And she talked so much about Lauren. I mean, I've worked with her and we've done incredible <laughs> things throughout her time working with me and, and, and have resolved so much in her health. But the first part of this was like a full paragraph about how amazing Lauren was. And Lauren was the solidifying factor as to why she even signed up because after she talked to Lauren and, and just the passion behind Lauren and her belief in physique development, it was a no brainer for her that she was working with, with me. And so having that time to either talk to the coach via DMs or getting on the call or speaking with their sales staff, those things are going to be tremendously important. And, and here's the thing, you have this word in your vocabulary that's so valuable, that so many people are so fearful to use. And that word is no. <laughs> I will, I will think about it. And I, I think that some individuals get caught up in like, they're going to force me to, to buy something right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
that is so weird to me. Like, we're not going to strong arm you and be like, no, 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 you have to give us your money right now. Give me your credit card. I don't want you if you don't want it. Exactly. Like, we're not going to put you in a headlock and be like, no, give us the credit card number. It's like, (laughs) we want you here if you want to be here, because I don't want to work with you if you were dragged here type situation. Mm -hmm. I want you to be excited. I want you to be bought in. I want you to really want this change in your body. And so getting on the call with Lauren and, and finding out the information and learning more about the service, that is like our due diligence to you. We, we want you to have all the information so that you can make the most informed decision about your health. This is a big deal. Yeah. Like you are making an investment into yourself as well as you're in a very vulnerable place because you are reaching out to someone to help you with the most important thing to you being your health and your body and, and your internal function. And so we don't take that lightly. We want you to be very comfortable throughout the entire process. One thing that people really compliment us on is the whole process from the time that they inquire to how they're cared for throughout the process and the time that they start working with the coach and all those things. Because you and I have made a painful focus on that because we have seen way too many times of this process being so clunky and not a warm feeling for the person who's trying to figure out if this is the right fit for them. And so we've been painfully meticulous and have such an awesome team that helps with this now that it's just... I, I get so, (laughs) I get so frustrated when someone's like, well, I I don't want to bother you. It's like, I want you to bother me. (laughs) Like I would prefer for you to bother me so that we can get on the same page of, is this the right thing for you? And can we help you? Like, can we really get you to the place that you want to be? So (laughs) I, I think that you made an incredible point of people following you for three months, six months, or a year before they sign up. Because when it comes to myself, I normally, especially for a higher investment or something that's going to be more of a commitment, I'm normally not going to immediately just go to something without vetting them or looking into anything without a friend referral. Right. So a good example of this is when it comes to anything like Botox or face stuff. I don't know diddly squat about that. And so I don't feel comfortable going to someone because I don't know what I'm doing or what I'm looking for. But when it comes to Katie, if she says, hey, this person is great at this, I can immediately take her word for it and go for it and have done that and been like, okay, awesome. Where otherwise, that's something I'm going to take a while to make a decision on. And I want people to take time to make that decision. I don't want someone to follow us or follow me and then inquire and get get a feel for what it's about, learn what it's about. And I think one really important thing and something we've always encouraged people to do is reach out to our clients. Yes, please. Reach out to people's clients if you really want to hear. Like if you want an honest opinion, yes, reviews on sites are great. And like all of the reviews on our site, all the testimonials are all 100% real. We didn't lie about any of those. But I understand as a customer of sometimes you can read those and be like, okay, well, they picked the good ones. Right. So why don't you just reach out to any of our clients? Because if any of our clients are tagged on our stuff or post about us or anything, they have allowed us to tag them. So you can reach out to them. You can say, how was this experience? How did you feel about this? Because they don't owe it to us or anyone to say anything about positive about us unless they had a positive experience. And I just think that's such a powerful thing is I often look at reviews when I'm trying to figure out something or if I know someone has that thing, asking them about it. So it only makes sense if you're about to make this investment in your health, you trust the person you're investing in because what's the point of spending the money if you're going to be doubting the person the whole entire time? Makes no sense. That sounds like a waste of time, money, resources, and your like general livelihood if you are going to be doing something like that. So if you don't trust your coach, then find someone you trust. Exactly. What's the next one? (laughs) Uh, I can do it myself mentality, which we kind of already addressed there. But I think this is a good one. Coaches physiques, not how I would like them to look. This is interesting uh, because I think that it's there's a couple of different ways to look at it. And I am on the side of walking the walk. Like I think that you need to be doing the things to some degree 
of what you're encouraging your clients to do. Do I think that you need to be rock solid shredded abs, ab veins all the time? Absolutely not. If you're doing that, I believe that you are probably spending far more time on yourself than the clients. Like there's a, there's a, a middle ground that I did not know existed until I found it personally. And you can have the investment into your health while also investing into your client's health and be able to take care of yourself and then also take care of them. Like that's a real reality that's possible. I, for a long time, thought it was one or the other. And that was a hurdle for me early on in coaching because all I wanted to do was take care of my clients. And there was a period of time when we lived in Louisville that I was probably in the, the poorest health and taking care of myself that I had been in in my entire life of, I was glued to my computer 10 to 12 hours a day, not training, not eating well, not sleeping, um, and just obscenely obsessed with all of my clients being perfectly taken care of at all times and like handholding, which was not necessary at all, but that's what I was doing and that's all I knew at the time. And so there, there is an aspect of just walking the walk that's tremendously important. And I also think that it allows for the client to believe more in the process because they're seeing you investing into it as well, um, relative to the person who is not following the protocols or, you know, investing into their health, but then, um, you see them posting on their story of going out on the weekends and, um, being very rambunctious on Friday and Saturday night. And then they get, you get to their, your check-in on Monday or Tuesday. And they're like, why were you getting fucked up on Friday? And it's like, you were doing the same thing, bro. <laughs> why are you getting upset with me? And it's like that, that type of situation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I will never ask my client to do anything that I would not be willing to do as well as I'm not going to sit here and be like, I'm, you know, I'm holier than thou and I can do these things and you can't type situation. It's like, I want you to feel as though that I'm in alignment with you as well. And we're walking together relative to me, like looking down upon you. Yeah. Do I think that someone to be able to coach needs to be in good shape or to be a good coach? Not necessarily. I think there can be people that know how to coach and how to do it and might not look like look the look. But I think that you're you're only helping yourself if you do. Right. Because when we look at people as a whole, myself included, we're visual people. And if I see someone who is overweight and then telling me what to do when it comes to my weight, then I'm kind of like, why would I do that? Because you're not doing that, exactly what you just said. But I think that there can be people intelligent enough to do it, but it only helps you to look away a certain way. And I think that's extremely valid as a customer to say that of you don't really look the way that I want to. So I'm not sure if you can get me the results if that coach doesn't have a laundry list of results to show them otherwise. A huge part of coaching is confidence. Yeah. And it you can't guide people if you don't have the confidence in what you are teaching. And the best way to build confidence is to fill your own cup up and to take care of yourself and, and maintain the promises that you've made to yourself. And so if you're not investing into your own health and you're not investing into your overall well-being, how can you come from a place of confidence? You're, you're more, more so speaking from a place of like hearsay, and that's not a place of confidence, nor is the, the client going to believe like, well, I, you know, they heard that this worked, so I guess I'm going to also do it type situation. It's like, you got to be in the trenches and you got to be taking care of yourself for the, the client to also buy in. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Another one here was I've worked with multiple other coaches and not seen the results I've wanted. So why would this be any different? This can be looked at so many different ways because is it that you've worked with so many coaches and tried to go with the most budget-friendly option to where your expectations are that you should get a very detailed hands-on service, but you're paying $100 a month? Because if your expectations were out of alignment for what you, what you signed up for, 
I, I can't be too upset with that. You should have had better expectations and been in better alignment or asked more questions or whatever the case may be. Now, it could be an individual who has paid very good money for the coaching and expected things to be much more hands-on. And um, in those situations, I empathize with that. Like I, I, I have such a uh, desire to fix that for people. When people come in and they're like, I've paid X, Y, and Z, I've worked with X, Y, and Z person, and I just haven't gotten the results that I wanted. I've, everything's fallen short. I'm very, I'm rubbed the wrong way with coaching in general. I love the opportunity <laughs> to change that. Yeah. I love to provide the 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 real results and real coaching that they should have gotten the entire time. And it's such a cool experience to flip that switch for people. And so depending on the situation, I think that you have to really look at the different coaches that you've worked with and understand that one, not all coaches are the same. That's an easy thing to, to realize. But the second thing is, is that your health is of tremendous importance. And if you don't have the knowledge or desire to gain the knowledge on your own, you're going to have to work with someone to get to the place that you want to be. And so taking more time to vet through and asking questions, speaking with their clients and, and asking as many questions as you can um, is the way to stop having that experience. I think that reflection definitely needs to be part of it because you also need to reflect on what was your effort or did you follow what they said or did you maybe not even trust what they were saying and so you weren't able to get the results that you wanted. But when I saw this come through, I had a client specifically come to mind. Her name is Elizabeth and she had worked with three other coaches in the industry and she had not seen the results. And honestly, I was just so happy that she vocalized that that was the reason that she had hesitation. Instead of of giving an excuse or anything like that. It was very point blank of, I am scared to make another investment because this has been my experience. And so from there, I was able to have her send over, hey, what did you roughly do with these coaches? She sent over, okay, I was in a diet from this time frame. I was in a bulk. But then when I went through this next diet, I didn't feel like I saw the results from the bulk. And I actually had her go ahead and fill out some forms. And we committed to working together because I told her what we were going to do before we started working together and before she made a payment because of that exact reason. I wanted to prove her, not prove her wrong, but prove to her that not all coaches are the same and to just get her the results she deserved to have all along. And it had nothing to do with her not being a hard worker or her not being able to do something. She was able to reflect and see these coaches didn't take my life into consideration. They didn't take my job into consideration and they didn't really listen to what I was needing out of this. And I actually went through her onboarding document and I remember being like, she's checking a ton of the boxes. I want wonder why her results aren't what she wants them to be. And then I had her send training clips, and that was a huge eye-opener of there's mentality and your training here that is holding you back, and we're going to implement these things. But I recently talked to her, and she had said, after working with three prior coaches, I was very nervous to commit to a new coach, not quite knowing how different physique development could be. But I couldn't have been more wrong. The personalization of my program, nutrition, feedback is unmatched. I have never had a coach so invested in who I am as a person, my goals, and creating a plan that fits my life realistically. Sue has changed my life for the better. And that like just filled up my heart so much because I felt her resistance was starting and it was so valid. And there was nothing that I could say to make it better of the other situations, but I knew I was going to show her you're going to get results here. And I think that that does just come down to vetting the coach and then being able to have some reflection of what was the reason there wasn't success or what could be one of the reasons there wasn't success there. Absolutely. And this this brought up, uh, when you said that, it brought up one of the, the question responses um, from a former client, Kayla. She had said that the limiting belief was the cost, but since having a coach with physique development, I can 100% verify it is worth it. That was cool. That was a very, yeah, very, was very cool sweet. To see. Very sweet. 
we're going to go into the last one that was submitted here. So it was fear of coaches not actually helping me to reach the goals I have set, either because they do not actually know how to guide me there or they are not invested in my success or goals. I also worry if coaches can actually hold their promises and if they will actually have time and interest to invest. A lot there. Mm -hmm. So what was the first one? If they have the ability to guide them there or invest in their goals. Okay. So the the first thing being the ability. And I think that you can learn this oftentimes through and, and and my perception may be a little skewed because of how much free information we give out. Like you could listen to uh, all 140 episodes of this podcast. You could watch all of our YouTube videos. You could watch all of our short form content on different platforms and get a really good idea of like, do I, <laughs> do I know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Does Sue know what she's talking about? Um, and so I think leaning into that is important. Then asking the questions is also important. The third thing would be looking at transformations. Like, have they taken individuals that look similar to you and you have the the goal of whatever change you're wanting to see in their body, have they made that happen? And I would also just ask the question, like, can you really do this? And, and I think that it's fair to ask and, and, it, and it has a response that could be helpful to put your mind at ease or give you reasoning as to why it can happen. Or maybe by asking the question, it gives you clarity of like, they really don't have the resources. They really don't know how to get me to where I need to be. Um, and then the second one. If they can actually hold their promises and if they have the time and interest to invest. If they have the time and an interest to invest, this one kind of comes back to the the coach. Like, I don't think that they should be taking clients that they don't have the time to invest. But I also understand that there are maybe coaches who are earlier on that are just trying to get people in the door. And or later on coaches. Or, or later on coaches, I guess, too. <laughs> um it's it's hard for me to to think about because of how in depth our service is and and how serious we take like each person's success to be had um and it, we're not playing a numbers game mm -hmm. like we are at like we charge a luxury price for our service for good reason so that we're not playing the numbers game and you don't fall into the situation that you're like, well, do they even have the time to work with me? It's like things are set up for me to have the exact amount of time for you to be here. Mm -hmm. And that's how we have it situated. And so that should never be a concern. But in the grand scheme, I still think it comes back to vetting more. I think that comes back to asking the right questions of what does the check-in process look like? What access do I have for the coach? What does it look like for the response time? And really understanding what you want out of the service to be able to even see what the service is going to be able to provide for you. But I was super happy with all of these questions because I thought that they really did just summarize what a lot of people's fears are when it comes to coaching. And I'm glad that we are able to break down and have a conversation about it. But I'd be interested if you have any further questions or even rebuttals to what we talked about, because we are very passionate about coaching, as Alex mentioned, and we want people to see results. I think that that's what's allowed our business to work the way it has. Is at the core of it, we care about quality coaching and getting people results. And then everything after after that is just extra. And so with that at the core, we want to help. We want to answer the questions. We want you to bother us. You we want you to be in our DMs. We want all of those things. So thank you guys so much for listening and or watching. We would love if you gave this a thumbs up, if you are on YouTube and subscribe, if you're listening on a podcast, if you can go ahead and leave us a review and or share with a friend, that would be phenomenal. But thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll catch you in the next one.